into virtual account delay. Okay, so it looks like it's time to start. So hi everyone. Uh, I think I have to get started because it, since it's video recorded also and going online, we have to start at an exact time. So hi everyone, I'm Elena. Uh, and the topic I'm gonna be talking today is a work, presenting a work uh, we have been doing for now for about one and a half years. And you see a lot of people who have contributed here. I just wanted to call everyone out, everyone out who even contributed a tiny bit to this project. And um, I have given another talk uh, last year, virtual talk at uh, Linux Security Summit on the same topic. But it was a year ago and we were pretty early in the, uh, I mean, we, it was the same project, but we were pretty early in, in establishing our kind of uh, methodology and fuzzing setup and we didn't have much results yet and so on. So, so now it's really the time to go uh, to present what, like, what advanced we've done in the past year. And also, uh, basically what I want to go over is this is to remind, okay, why are we doing this project? So why is it needed? Uh, what are we trying to do? How do we trying to approach this problem? And then walk you through different aspects of a kernel, which we believe will need hardening under this confidential cloud computing threat model. And, and I'm sure I don't have nearly a uh, like full list here. So uh, it's actually like one of the point of this talk is to also initiate a discussion to kind of um, to see and, and to kind of to to make you as a Linux security community start thinking about things, about these things, if you're interested in a use case and threat model and, 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 uh, and, and basically start discussions together. It's okay, what else is missing? What else we have to be looking into and so on. And I'm gonna show some of the results uh, also at the end. So let's start. So why do we need to harden, uh, why do we need to harden Linux kernel for the confidential cloud computing guest? So traditionally, the uh, legacy VM uh, scenario, like, um, like you can see here, the trusted computing base of a guest, uh, of course, it includes everything that runs inside the guest, uh, but then it, it also it had a full dependency on the host side. So the hypervisor, I mean, if you're talking about the Linux-based host, so the KVM and KVM in user space, everything used to be trusted. So the guest would literally, like the KVM uh, had full introspection into guest memory, registers, it could get anything at once. And, 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 and this has been a model for like a decade or so. Now, when we think of the uh, confidential cloud computing and we start to have this protected VM guests, the threat model changes. So now the whole point of this confidential cloud computing technology is like Intel has Intel TDX, AMD has AMD CF, and I'm sure there's more coming. So the point is that now you don't want to trust the hypervisor. So you want to make sure that uh, your guests, so, so you have this hardware technology, I mean, they're different, they're implemented in a different way, it actually doesn't matter how it's done, but what it guarantees you, it guarantees you that the guest is protected from a hypervisor, it guarantees memory protection, protection of registers, and so on and so forth. And, and for example, like in, uh, I know Intel architecture uh, better, much better, so in Intel case, there's some special software, which called GDX module, and it's, it's a software module which kind of plays a role of the shim, of the secure shim in between the VM guest, protected VM guest and the uh, untru now untrusted hypervisor. And it, it kind of makes sure that the, um, the hypervisor can't really do a lot of bad things to the guest. And I'm not gonna go into details how TDX works or anything of that, it's, it's really a separate topic. But uh, when you think of it, okay, so, so, so this protected technologies give us this, this nice protection of this VM guest. But why, why would we need to think about cardening? But unfortunately, so, so unfortunately, the problem is that even if we have it all protected and let's assume it all works absolutely perfect, so let's not go to try to think like what can be problems of all these technologies, we still need to be able, the guest still needs to talk to the host. So it still needs to talk to hypervisor for actually quite many things. So we still have a lot of this um, interaction, uh, primary if we have a lot of this um, kind of parallel uh, operations happening. So even every guest would need to read an MSR or perform a MAMIO or PortIO or anything of that. It will actually, it needs to go and, 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 and at least in many of the scenarios, it needs to go and, and request this operation to be done by the host. And in TDX specific case, it's done with one hyper call, which is TDX specific. So this is just implementation detail. It doesn't actually matter how, how it's done or like on, on the high level, but we, uh, but at the end, you, you, you start to get this input. So basically all now of this MSR, CPU ID reads, all of this, uh, the PCI config space reads, but it, you just kind of consume, now suddenly becomes untrusted. 
So it can be anything, it's a malicious input. And same applies for the shared memory, because uh, many of these uh, protected kind of, I mean, at least the current, both I think AMD and, and TDF set up the shared memory between the protected guest and the untrusted host. And anything in that shared memory, which is usually a lot of DMA going through, is also unprotected. So it's untrusted, it, it can have any inputs, it's cost, hosted and hypervised and controlled. And if you think of this, this is, and if you start looking into the kernel source code, this is a huge attack surface. So I have some numbers for 5.11, uh, well, it's old numbers, but it doesn't actually change that much for kernel versions. So it's, 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 it's a lot of kernel locations, basically, where you would perform all these different kind of MMIO reads or port IO reads or PCI config space reads. Most of it are in drivers, uh, which is to some degree good because as I'll talk a bit later, there is a way to limit what kind of drivers can run in the guest. But still, even if you kind of drop the drivers, there's still huge attack surface, even in the core, uh, like if we talk about x86 and the core x86 architecture code uh, and, and just core kernel code, which performs a lot of these things, which is now can be untrusted. And, and when we looked into the code, it's, it varies a lot. Uh, the complexity of handling these untrusted inputs now, it, it varies a lot. Sometimes it's just simple bit reads, masking, like nothing happening very really, nothing to worry about. But sometimes the complexity is very, uh, it's very complex. There's a lot of struct parsing going on and things like that, pointers being passed. And, 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 and the main point here is that that code in the kernel, this is the standard mainline code, but it has never been written in mind that, uh, that inputs can be malicious. Maybe with exception of things like USB and stuff, which has been kind of for some level of fuzzing in things. Networking also, network drivers kind of always taken into account, but not with low level things. We never thought that like, you know, an MSR read or, you know, PCI config space read can be now untrusted. And now it really can from a point of view of a guest. So, and, and, and a single bug, if you have like, you know, buffer overflow out of index array and something which is exploitable, it's, it can actually render this technology, this fancy hardware technology, this protected guest technology, so it can render it useless because, yes, you have protected all the memory and registers and everything, but you have just consumed this malicious input, you got an exploit and, and you took over the guest and you're running inside the guest and you have all, all of it control, you see unencrypted memory because you're inside and everything. So that's why it's actually very important to think about this. It's, it's, it's a really a model change. It's a new threat model. But we have to start thinking about if we want to run secure Linux kernel guests in our uh, confidential cloud computing. So what we have been doing about it is we developed like this, this approach, how we, of course, like our focus has been for TDX, but it's, it's, it's literally applies for any confidential cloud computing and for kernel, we try to kind of do this uh, iterative approach with uh, different steps. It's really iterative. It's not like step one, two, second, third, and we are done. We kind of kept doing it in a loop. So we try to minimize the amount of things we have active in a guest. So of course we kind of minimized uh, the drivers, we only enable like a small set of virtual drivers to be active and so on. Disable all the subsystems we don't need uh, in virtual guests, for example, there's a lot of subsystems we would never use or like on cores and things like that, uh, like minimizing open IO ports and so on. So whatever we can, we try to minimize when what has to be enabled for, you know, for the guest to run and interact. We have to basically, we have to go through the code auditing. We have developed the static analyzing tools for, for doing this and tracking this information using Smudge. Uh, and I have had actually talk last year, as I said, which goes in more details, how we did kind of the methodology we have. And I have pointers at the end to our both documentation and tooling, which is all open sourced, uh, both for audit and fuzzing. And, 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 uh, and yeah, and, and after the code audit, or at the same time as the code audit, we also need to do fuzzing because of course code audit is even like static analyzer driven, it's very error prone. Uh, we might not find all the places we might miss, humans might miss and they make mistakes and so on. So we actually developed an extensive fuzzing setup for, for reaching all these locations and most of it is only active during the boot. So it's actually not very easy to reach. You can't use any existing fuzzing tool like syscallers or anything because they, they're really not designed to insert, like it, it's really syscaller is more like for the uh, syscall path and inserting all that way. And now we have to basically reach all these millions of code locations like PCI config space reads and such, which is scattered through code through the uh, kernel source code. And we don't want to do instrumentation on each of it because that would be way too much work and very intrusive for the kernel. So we want to have like generic setup where the fuzzing setup can be injected. But, um, but this is like an overall thing we have been doing. 
And then uh, what I want to go now is, is, is really just to go through these different aspects, how, how did we approach it. So as I said, we have this uh, bunch of things which, uh, which the guest kernel can read, uh, can obtain kind of the, uh, re can do reads for, for all of these things. And, and the input in that case will come from the host. The writes we don't care because it, it's kind of the other way around. And, and there are all these things that I'm going to go like just one by one. They're all in principle in our case done using this specific hypercall, but it's just a transportation method. It's not, it's not actually doing anything. It doesn't like, and if you think that if you could use that hypercall for do any checks, you actually cannot at that point because you literally don't know anything about of this thing. What is the type of thing that you're consuming? So you can see, yes, it's a port I read and here's your value, but you don't have a context at that point. The context only matters in that source code location where you actually perform this port I read. So, so it's just a transportation method, it doesn't matter. So if I start going through this one by one, so I mean for MSRs, uh, I mean for us, we're kind of separated in two groups. We have a bunch of MSRs which are trusted. So we know that like they are controlled in our case by TDX module. Some of them simply are not allowed to kind of, you can't read them in the guests because the features have been disabled. There are some which are context switched um, uh, and, and, and they're also fine. So because you, you want to go like the value would be provided to the guest upon the read uh, natively. Uh, and you want to do this all detour for asking that value from the host. But then, we, of course, we also have a bunch of untrusted ones. And in our case, we, if you try to read with MSR, by, if, if a kernel tries to read with MSR from any point of code, you will, um, in the guest kernel, you will get this special event with virtual exception insert in the, in the guest kernel. We have a handler there. And the handler will look and say, oh, yeah, this was an MSR read. Let's just ask the host because it's obviously like, you know, we, we, we don't get it natively. And this is where the host will input your MSR value and this is where it can provide a malicious input. So the MSR is actually pretty easy. We, uh, we have done the audit and fuzzing and, and because the handling of MSR is usually so simple, it's like bit masking and stuff. We, has, we haven't been really seeing much of the, or actually we haven't been seeing any issues with regards to MSR reads. Uh, we did see things like you have to always be careful because like, uh, they might enable certain features, which uh, you might not want to have enabled in the guest, but otherwise there's not like in index out of bounds or anything with regards to MSR. So, but we, we still fuzz them and kind of treat them this way. CP address are very similar. Again, so we have trusted and untrusted case. And, and, and we have the same thing that we try to kind of disable uh, here as, as much as we can. And this was kind of the first strategy, but then uh, recently, it has been changed that uh, we don't even allow most of the CPU ID reads out of protected guests uh, uh, to the host. So we only allow this small range at the end, which is uh, which is intended like the software uh, software for KVM things, uh, the software C C control CPU IDs, and that kind of solves most of our problems for CPU IDs because this range is actually very little used in the core core uh, kernel code. So. Uh, the port is slightly more interesting. So, uh, I mean, we don't support port IO from user space. So if that happens, user space tries to read a port IO from uh, this, this will be not allowed. But then, of course, for all the kernel port IO done in the kernel code, uh, what we did is that we have this uh, small uh, kind of a low list of ports which we are allowed to read from the, from the host uh, to minimize this part of attack surface minimization. You have this example of just code snippets, like what kind of port we leave open for this protected guest. And, uh, and this port IO filter applies for early and normal port IO operations, not no active and decompressed mode. We kind of so far think that it's uh, kind of reasonable compromise that we, um, it's not very big uh, threat in that mode. Uh, we do audit and fuzz it regardless. Uh, of course, taking into account that these things are only ones which are opened. Uh, again, port IO is, is, is also pretty simple and, and, and we haven't had any interesting findings here, which I guess many people could kind of uh, think this and look, but this would be the case. Uh, but, but regardless, you can have, and, and, and because we also have to remember that all our findings are limited only to the core kernel and set of drivers we enable. So we are not going to go and analyze absolutely all the drivers. There's a lot of drivers in a kernel. So of course, if you are running, uh, let's say if you will be running your Linux guest with some drivers, which is outside of virtio set, and we would be doing some port IO, uh, and, and you, might need, you might need to add this, 
this portaios into this filter list, but you will also have to perform this uh, kind of fuzzing rounds and things. You can use our methodologies to do that, but we haven't done it for arbitrary drivers. It's, it's way too big kind of uh, thing to cover. So, so every time I'm saying that we haven't made any findings, it's always limited only to a subset of drivers and the core x86 code we tested. So it's, it's not, of course, like, you know, all, all ES config of all the drivers and stuff. So moving to MMIU, uh, a similar situation to the port, a very similar port IO, but um, so we don't enable it from user space. We have this patch, which basically, or the set of patches, which, uh, which makes the uh, MMIO kind of opt-in, so, so that you have to explicitly kind of uh, indicate what you want to share with MMIO region with the host. Because by if we, I think early on we had the implementation was kind of the other way around, that all of this MMIO automatically became shared, and it was very dangerous because like you suddenly now don't have any control of what kind of regions you're sharing with the host from the guest, and 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 uh, you don't know what is your attack surface. Now it's all all opt-in. It's kind of wrapped wrapped nicely for PCI devices. So if your PCI device is authorized, we have device filter as I said. If its device is authorized from this allow list, it will automatically all of its MMIO mappings become shared. But for these devices, we already do a fuzzing and auditing, and and then we know we kind of we went through that attack surface, and and we know that it's okay. So every time you kind of similar here from MMIO, every time you will add a new device to uh, your allow list and things you will have to uh, you will have to do the additional hardening and, and, um, and basically follow the same process so but for the uh, virtio uh, and for virtio drivers and for core kernel again we haven't had much of findings on the MMIO yet but the next one is actually one which which has been the most one of the most problematic so the PCI config space so so PCI config space, I don't know how many people know, so it's pretty low level kind of kernel code. It, it's used to kind of obtain in, uh, in a lot of its in, in device probing stages and things. It, it's used to obtain a lot of information about device configuration. And it used to be like, you know, this is basically you would read, you would read hardware. Uh, so nobody thought this being untrusted. But now all this is PCI config space is host controlled. So host can insert anything. We are kind of limited by only allowing this, this traditional early this probing for CF8. We don't allow this MCFG space type of PCI config space, but still it's, you can do, you can do this PCI config space access, uh, which is going to be host controlled. And, and we have actually found quite some issues with, even with the drivers we have enabled and in the core code. So I have example here, which is for 5.15. Uh, and this is the code from Virtio uh, core. Uh, it's VP modern map capability. It's, it's, it's in the Virtio, one of the Virtio uh, core code. Uh, and, uh, and, and you can see here it performs, and this is very typical actually scenario for a lot of PCI config space. So it performs a bunch of PCI config space reads. And now all these reads, like I, I highlighted just one, the bar, where it gets a bar value. All these reads are host controlled essentially, so it can be anything up to the value of the, that variable. Now it's U8 variable. And then, uh, and it's not known, of course, like case was presenting all these things, which like you can try to determine at compile time, or it's of course nothing is known at compile time. It's fully runtime, and it's runtime only when it's it's like you know if you actually start fuzzing and, and kind of reaching with the fuzzer. But what what happens later if you ignore this addition for now is that it will go and use these bar values to perform different calculation on this resource allocation, and it will use it as an index into the resource arrays. And, 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 and you can easily see, and, and, and this resource array is something like five, to five or, or something like that. So, so you can easily have like out of bound accesses straight there. And, and for like simple fix, like example for 515 is that you can add these checks now to basically control that your the bar value which you got now is, 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 is basically you have this very trivial kind of value check on, on, on before you start kind of passing it later and kind of uh, Sometimes it's not even trivial because you can have this consumed and when you can do some operation it's in reassigning things and at the end all this host input propagates and then you can do some indexing and, and, and based on that value. So uh, it actually doesn't apply I think for 5.17 or 5.15 the code was changed there is actually a check already there. So this, this uh, slowly kind of gets fixed. Uh, uh, in the main line, but uh, there are a lot of this kind of style issues, and, and with, especially with PCI config space, what we saw 
and our and we have the patch also which kind of I mean we do, do the audit and fuzzing and this is how we found these things uh, for our methodology but what we we find out that it's very uh, difficult to again we have this such a future attack surface so we're trying to minimize it as much as we can so we have a patch I have a link here which tries to block this PCI config space access also for similar like for MMIO from devices which are not allowed uh, but there is actually a bunch of problems with this patch so we still have to figure out how to make it work correctly it's currently make some issues and libvirt and, and, and some of the very weird kind of side effects we don't even yet sure what happens so it certainly works from security point of view it blocks it <laughs> but like uh, the, the side effects are not quite currently kind of uh, very desirable so so yeah so that's the PCI config space so definitely problematic and are very actively used by a lot of drivers in probing stage so uh, the, I can imagine many drivers having kind of the similar issues because again from a driver perspective from that code has been written like the person who wrote the driver never thought that like you know can get malicious input from PCI config space read so it's this code has never been written with that in mind and the last the last one from this um, the list of different kind of uh, types of inputs you can get is it's KVM specific KVM has its own hyper calls and CPU IDs and and this are kind of a, we were very kind of drastic about it because they're all untrusted obviously call comes from KVM so we just disabled pretty much everything you can and left only the things which are ever, like trivially secure or essentially trivially secure so we and we kind of see if we need it to, to think about it later if, if functionality is actually needed. We haven't needed it for now. But it's definitely one of the things also to think about if you think of securing your, your guests. So moving on into shared memory, as I said, there's another big, big area where you typically, what you call, you typically use your protected guest is that you set up a shared memory because memory is all protected. So it's private to the guest. The host and hypervisor cannot see into memory. So if you want to do some DMA or anything, you need to establish a shared pages, which is essentially kind of unprotected, unencrypted, or maybe encrypted under a different key, but it's accessible to the host. So, and, 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 and this is also the, uh, and a lot of DMA happening, as I said, and all the virtio happening, at least in our case, uh, it's all of virtio is gonna happen uh, over the shared memory pages. So uh, we have spent, uh, we, we have this list of virtual drivers which we enable, you can see the list here and maybe we'll have some more in the future and we have to basically inspect for all of these core drivers and things, we have to inspect how it handles all these kind of uh, data structures and things it keeps in the shared memory because again it's all can be now untrusted and, and uh, we have also virtuous complex kind of in many ways, it has many modes, it supports and kind of types and we have tried from one side, we've tried again to disable as many as possible. We said that, okay, we don't need the virtual PCI legacy mode. We can disable virtual MMIO and so on. Support only this, it has these different modes of types of virt queues and things it supports. So we kind of disabled everything which is not, we don't need and not commonly used. And then we, we basically, again, we audited and, and, and fast the rest. For the drivers we allow, not for all, there's more virtual drivers, we just don't need them yet. But then again here it's the catch is also to remember that we we do this for, of course for the for the core driver code and how the driver handles it but the driver at the end is going to obtain some payload data from the host and it's going to send it up for somewhere to process and that payload data is entrusted and it has to be verified separately it's from our point of view it's considered application data you can protect it in different ways if you want like uh, it's just like you know application data payload but we can't do anything about it. It's out of even kernel hands, like uh, after it's 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 has been delivered. Uh, another aspect we had to think about is that, uh, of course, everyone is usually like you know we we want to run secure computations inside of this protected guest and so on, and and uh, and we need randomness. Everyone is like crypto needs randomness, secure randomness, and and we don't want our randomness to be controllable or observable by the host now. And, and of course for Linux, it's, we have the Linux RNG uh, which runs, uh, like this is the primary source of cryptographic randomness that a lot of user space and kernel uses. And it's main, it has a number of uh, structure, it has like a number of sources of interrupts, but we, if you don't enable any hardware support of, of things and so on, the main source is going to be just, just interrupts. And interrupts are host observable now, so we can't really rely on this like 
uh, it's, it becomes kind of scary to think that now you're kind of <laughs> your entropy and, and, and things inside of your guest is, is can be controlled at least at least observable by the host or predictable to some degree so uh, but for, fortunately uh, if you think of uh, def u random which is kind of gets an output out of this uh, cha cha 20 base DRNG it has this option uh, implemented ages ago that you can uh, you can indicate through the config random trust CPU you can say that you can you trust CPU hardware random number generator which present on different types of CPU Intel has it on this through this RD runt and RDC instructions and then it will on every iteration of this every time you ask this random uh, bits out it will add it will kind of inject a fresh entropy from these instructions in our case uh, and, and this is not a host controlled thing and then also it will do an early seeding of a generator with chacha based DRNG using this, this RG runt and RGC instruction again this is not a host controlled so at least by forcing this uh, forcing these options uh, basically forcing to trust this uh, hardware number generator we have some way of arguing at least that we have some independent source of entropy which is not in the host control it's not like perfect because host still will observe the interrupts and stuff but it's already better than just saying that like a host can observe all our entropy at least to some degree and then we also like reinforce things like looping and things like that to make sure that we we don't we always like we always require this to succeed and we don't go want to fall back to things which are uh, untrusted uh, going further uh, Another thing is the timers. Everyone wants secure time, uh, and we, uh, for us, uh, we have only limited uh, trusted clock inside a protected guest. It's based in TC, and it's kind of limited, so it's not full clock. It's, it has just properties like synch it's synchronous and monotonic, and uh, there's no guarantees that it will match real time. But if you want to do it, you can kind of do your own setup inside a guest and use some. Uh, time server and, 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 and perform using this local TC and so on you can kind of establish this process of, of getting the real time uh, but what we need to make sure is that we need to disable the other clock sources which which all kind of fall back one way or another going back to the host so the KVM clock obviously in KVM controlled and the ICP IPM HPAT and so on so so we, we really kind of we went and, and disabled a bunch of these things to make sure that we kind of we always we only use the TC because this is this is something we have at least some reasoning, or we can have provide some guarantees about what 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 the time is. Another interesting kind of aspect you have to think about if you try to kind of think of a whole picture of protecting the secure guest is the ICPI. So um, there are a lot of ICPI tables which virtual firmware will pass you, like we pass to the guest uh, to the kernel, a poly startup in our case. TDVF is virtual firmware, it's basically just a special kind of breed of, uh, we call it TDVF, but it's a special breed of EDK2. And, and, and it will pass all these tables. Uh, luckily for us, these tables are part of our remote attestation. So you can't just pass the garbage tables and see what happens to your um, ICPI and IML interpreter um, and your drivers. Uh, and we do an additional thing of, of again, we're going defining this allow list of tables, which we even want to consider in the guests. So, I mean, virtual firmware can try to pass as many, but this is the only list we're going to actually like allow to be run uh, to just to minimize the attack surface. But even all of that said, some of these tables are very complex and, and, and uh, we have a lot of features and it's not clear, like we probably don't even need all these features. And uh, it's not clear if, like, even if these tables are, let's say, attested, uh, it's not clear if, like, how much of the attesting party would understand, like, you know, all these details there, and, and, and you can kind of, who's going to be developing these tables, and you can have vulnerabilities in the interpreter, and so on. So this is, like, kind of an area we haven't really dived into. We kind of understand some of the risk there, but uh, we haven't had any bandwidth to go and start, because I'm an interpreter is complex. There is a lot of things uh, and all these ICPI kind of uh, table structures are complex enough and, and we, need to, we need to be able to also in the future to think of how we want, if we want to properly harden it because I, I expect not, not for all confidential computing guests we would have this setup that the ICPI tables are at least like attested or trusted to some degree but if, especially if they are not and you can you know, input arbitrary garbage there then this becomes actually a very big problem. Um, 
going next, when, when you have to think of things like what changes and things like interrupts and panics. And, and for us, like the only, the in 462 uh, pick for interrupt handling, uh, we have some limitation, we have some additional limitations on what kind of non-NMI uh, interrupts are allowed to be inserted. But still, it's, it's like the host has, the KVM and host has some control over what, what, what it can input, where it's a post interrupt mechanism and so on. And, and the bigger problem is also that all now IPIs, like between the different communication between the processors, the virtual CPUs in our case, because we're running virtuals, they're all still host controlled fully. So the KVM of host can just drop them. We can't like even ever think what they can deliver. And, and, and this is what is used during panic. So if you want, if you, if you let's say you, you, you reach some security issue and you want to you understand it now, you have to panic a kernel. The panic is kind of a complex operation. It's not atomic. It issues with different IPIs to different, uh, our, in our case, virtual CPUs to notify that this happened. And the host can just drop them. It just it would never be delivered. And, and there is this, uh, it would be nice to make it kind of reliable. We've had some discussions on it. It's not clear how to do it like properly. And, and we don't really have any kind of concrete case we can show we found where it could be a problem. So we, because denial of service for us is, is, is not, it's outside of threat model. So the host anyway is in control of kind of, you know, starting and stopping with protected guests who just can refuse to start it. So we don't care about denial of service. But we haven't, we try to think of where the case we can think here where the consequences would be something worse than denial of service. So, but this, this un, the fact that we have kind of, we panicked in one CPU, virtual CPU, and the rest has never kind of keep going and we never got this notification if, if we can actually end up in, in security scenario where this, this is going to be kind of, we're going to actually have a security problem. So it, it feels bad. So that's why we want to try to think about it, but then kind of ask what people kind of, um, if people think of, find a way to kind of to see how we can, we can make this reliable or provide a kind of good use case uh, for, for judging why this, this should be like okay or not okay, like likely not, not okay. Um, a bit on the private memory management. So this is probably the only thing which is very TDX specific. Even though like uh, MD and also handles the private, uh, it has kind of similar, somewhat similar concept where the memory also. So, so for this protected guest, the memory pages, which, uh, which are private memory pages, and the guest, they have to be accepted before they can be used. It's a security kind of property of the architecture. And, and uh, it's typically a lot of it is accepted by virtual firmware when it starts building this kind of memory layout for the guest, but not everything because it's very hard, it's very kind of performance, um, it's not optimal to start accepting a lot of memory in advance, so it's, some of it has to be accepted by the Linux kernel in runtime. And it's important to not to reaccept twice because what is going to happen in kind of, you know, by hardware is that if you reaccept the memory page twice, the page is going to be fine, but it's going to be all zeroed. So if you happen to run some, you know, you're running some application, it's a page, it had some secrets there, I don't know, your keys, and, and, and you re-accept it, you kind of, you, you, you tricked your guest to re-accept the page, and then suddenly that page would be wiped out, and you're running your AS with zero keys, it's not going to be very secure. And you have no way to even detecting it as, as you know, from the process which uses it. So, so there's a logic implemented which kind of takes care of that. And then we have also another angle is that we need to make sure because we constantly get this virtual exception events when something is not behaving like, like a shoot uh, inside a guest kernel. And, and we have these crucial code sections like syscall path and stuff where if we get the, this virtual exception uh, it can be security problems. So we're also trying to block this. Uh, basically, we have a couple of cases here. It's not even maybe that interesting, which will generate us, which we can get. So the, the host, basically the KVM and or Malik hypervisor and the host can trick the guest to get to access to do a certain thing. And, and, um, and then it will generate this pound V and you can try to time it when the guest is in executing in a particular place. Let's say it's entering the syscall path and it's just about to switch, we, it's still running like with the uh, kernel stack and, and, and you can have all kinds of bad things happening. So we're also trying to kind of fix, fix that one to make sure that we don't get these events. Um, but it, it's, it's still kind of this kind of things you also have to think about. But this is a bit more specific to this memory management of the, of the hardware. And then the last, went, last slide before going to results. 
So we also started to think, uh, because everyone always thinks about these transit execution attacks, it's so always speculative uh, side channels. And, and it's actually a very complex topic and I'm not even fully qualified to kind of talk about it, but we started to think that uh, our guests, again, like guests which run inside the protected guests, they do have, we have responsibility for mitigating some of these attacks. It depends, uh, what the list is kind of depends on the, um, on the type of attack and what mitigations are done by the hardware. And in our case, what is, the rest is done by TDX module and so on. So it's kind of complex, but there's one group, which is Spectre V1, which we definitely know we have to protect. There's no additional mitigations happening anywhere. And there has been a lot of work in past done to protect, to kind of study this attack surface between the user space, again, between the user space and the kernel, and try to find all these gadgets and try to secure the kernel. But now we actually have exactly the same problem, just the attack surface is different. So now we have to try to find the Spectre V1 gadgets, not in the user space kernel path, but between the VMM, the uh, hypervisor, and the, uh, and the guest. And, and what we did is that uh, Smudge, as a static analyzer, it has a pattern, an existing pattern has been for a while there, it's called Check Spectre. It, you can use it to, and you, it was a while, as I said, it, you can use it to check the potential Spectre V1 gadgets between user space and kernel. And we have, and it used, uh, it basically what it did is it used these internal Smudge structures to track the, the, basically all the inputs you can get from user space and how it propagates for all of the kernel to the extent Smudge can manage, of course. And then it would always ask, okay, is this index where kind of, you know, of, of a bound, is this index belongs to, has been influenced by the user space input. So now we've done the change. So we have now the similar basically tracking done for the host input. So we have a way to ask, okay, is this input, is this variable in the kernel has ever been tainted with the host input. So which is always MSRs and so on and MMIOs input. And if it has been, you can use this flag and you can run with Spectre pattern. It's already like a merge to smudge and everything. You can say to it, okay, please just kind of tell me, put this analyzed host input on and it will show you potential. You run it for host, whole kernel source tree and it will show you potential gadgets for essentially this new attack surface. There's a lot of gadgets there. I mean, potential gadgets. I'm not saying every one of them is a sexual problem, but you have to start uh, looking into it. Of course, there are false positives there. Um, luckily, most of the findings are again in drivers and we disabled most of the drivers. So, but there are also findings in the core code and we just started looking at it. It's, 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 so I kind of keep repeating this, but it's, it's, it's a big attack surface. Nobody has been looking before which has exactly the same set of problems. Um, I mean, they're very kind of similar. Maybe there's a lot less going on, of course, like because there's not huge user space. It's still like, you know, this hypervisor uh, guest interaction, but still it's a big attack surface and they have all kinds of problems. We have worked for years uh, from user space and now we have to kind of start thinking it on that attack surface. And it's not TDX specific or anything. It's, it's, it's actually like, it's, it's Linux specific for this threat model. So let's see how much time I have. Um, so just to kind of uh, very quickly, uh, this has been kind of overall hardening for the code that we actually have enabled. We call it TDX guest code, but again, this is just Linux mainline. Uh, we kind of, uh, we, we, we run it for most of the work we've done. It's 5.15, but it's all transferable. So as I said, we use, we use, we do the round of audit, we do rounds of runs of auditing, we produce this automatic list of findings, all these code locations where this, this input is consumed. We run it for some filtering, we do the manual an analysis. Uh, we kind of classify this different with different kind of, uh, uh, we have different rates, so we, we can make and stack some code looks safe and easy handling, we can mark it as safe, or some code looks concerning, we can mark it a concern, but all of this is just manual audit. We need, when we do the actual fuzzing setup, and our fuzzing setup is pretty elaborate, we're using this KFL fuzzer. For most of the fuzzing, we also use a KFX fuzzer, but it's, its usage is just limited. Uh, but we basically do the fuzzing runs on all of this uh, kind of uh, all of this attack surface, and then uh, normal fuzzers. What we give you, we will give you a code coverage, and and Linux <laughs> Linux source code is huge. So if you just collect a code coverage and you get some number, let's say 40%, it's not going to give you any information about how many of these actual points that we want to reach, these ones which we labeled, let's say, safe and concerned, because we don't want to reach excluded code or something which we trust. We want to actually have precise information how much of that code we can reach. 
and and we have also kind of uh, this cross-referencing and, and matching and, and uh, against this auditing results and at the end we actually get the coverage information we need so that we know what how much of that code of our interest we reached with our father and when we can start tuning with others and, and, and get better at it. I uh, don't have time to go through this, uh, just to show that like, this is an example of, of what we end up with for the boot. We have about 24 harnesses and we started to create also user mode harnesses in all kinds of different parts of the boot. And, and, uh, and they depend, like sometimes we have very big harnesses when we are kind of okay, there's not too much things happening there of our interest. Uh, so we are okay with big level harnesses for something which is like, you know, Virtio and things, we want to have much more precise harnesses. Uh, to um, to make sure we can, because there's a lot of things going on, there's a lot of input consumed to the host, so we want to kind of fast this faster, so that's why how kind of harnesses logic is done. And we started to look on this user mode harnesses, which are also kind of very important for us. Some results, since I have to wrap up, so this is for 5.15. Uh, just to give you kind of an idea of, of what kind of things we're seeing, so we we have like we have our audit tag distribution, so a lot of code we likely can exclude, and and this is only for again most of the drivers are already dropped and non x 6 code is dropped, so this is I'm not even kind of including this into numbers, but even of that core x 6 code which is left and and the drivers we enable, we have this kind of distribution of attack of uh, how many concern kind of places we found and so on. Uh, we have a fuzzing coverage. This is already adjusted per these things. Above, so how much of the safe and concerned code locations we can actually reach with fuzzers, and it's not you can see it's not 100%, but we're working on it. Uh, and when and especially like for concern items, sometimes it's very corner cases how you need to reach this this particular location. You need certain things to be enabled and so on. We have found a bunch of bug. We have had so the audit basically with concern items means that we have found some issue in the code. Uh, and then we we have found also some bunch of things of fuzzing and, and we actually like we're finding things much faster when we're able to even process them because as I said nobody has been looking into this before so we have uh, we're mostly trying to look into different Kazan warnings and things like that and we um, and, and, and where we have patches already I mean patches are public uh, some of them like this is the numbers for 515 as I said some of these things already got fixed later in 517 or 515 so it might not apply but just an example like of, 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 of things we had time to look into and many of these things like like any of these fuzzers or any of these bug fuzzing uh, kind of uh, uh, findings you would need to kind of actually fix the problem to be able for fuzzer to reach deeper so it's, it's, it's kind of to some degree we, I feel we're still scratching the surface and uh, and 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 uh, we are, and this is where I want to go to a discussion point because we, are, I had like a bunch of people in the first uh, kind of slide saying people who have contributed in the past and so on, but at the end we're a very small team now. We have, I mean, probably about four persons not even working on this full time. So uh, going forward, this is actually a big effort if we want to have this uh, attack surface secured from the point of view of the, so if we want a Linux kernel to be secure under this confidential cloud computing thread model, so we really need to kind of collaborate with community and kind of establish some kind of a community uh, project or, 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 or I don't even know how to call it, but like we need to really establish continuous fuzzing of this attack surface. We have the tools now, so which, which, um, which work because like things, existing tools and stuff, we had to develop the the new uh, tools, because things like syscaller, as I said, and stuff are not applicable here. We need to do a lot of boot time snapshotting and things like that for it to work efficiently. And, uh, and, and, and we really need to start doing it for mainline kernel, because code is being checked in all the time. Every code being checked in could introduce this with problems. People have a way, should have a way to easily kind of find these things. And there are probably even many more hardening aspects that we even haven't had time to think about. So we just I repeat, we just really kind of, we are still, regardless of what we have been working on for a while, the surface, the attack surface is so big that it, it's still like it, uh, very early on in the kind of, you know, really trying to so kind of claim that we have this attack surface secured. So what I'm hoping to do today in the afternoon, I think where both sessions uh, would be, so I would like to invite anyone who is interested to discuss about this to both session for this confidential cloud computing securing guests. So. And uh, I have a bunch of reference here. So as I said, we have a documentation public, follow methodology, same things about all these different hardening aspects of the kernel. It's all kind of written down, so it's easier, not slides. 
uh, all our tools, there's one repo, but it pulls like millions of different repos and pulls from the fuzzers and things, So, but it's kind of nice setup you can try. It doesn't require any hardware, you can try it. We have a minimal emulation setup for our like TDX case, so you can run it in any hardware you have essentially. Modern, modern enough, like not super old system, but it requires some pin, pin and stuff. And then uh, we have the TDX case kernel is just where we have security patches and stuff which haven't been uh, sent to mainline yet. So yeah, so that's I guess all. I think we're out of time somewhat, right? So maybe if you, we have a buff session as I said at the end and you can catch me I think on the breaks and things like that. So thank you. <laughs>